In this episode I'm going to try and make this old Lima tank wagon look like this picture I pinched off of Paul Bartlett's website. I picked this one up for six quid at my local model shop. I also got a donor wagon that was going to provide wheels, buffers and bogies and the remnants of that will become another scratch building project in the future. After breaking it down into its component parts, all four of them, the first job was to strip the old paint off, which was done with Precision Paints Super Strip 2, and it took literally two minutes. Then add some visual interest to the roof of the barrel by putting some ribs on. Because this was marketed as a double O scale model, it was actually built or produced as a HO scale model. And in so being, even things like the buffer spacing is wrong. So that's why I'm taking the buffers off and replacing them with ones off the donor wagon. And they also look a bit more mm, continental. And appearance is going to play a lot in this build because these wagons were produced in the 70s and 80s in various different liveries and disguises. Some without the ladder, some with the ladder. I know, I had a few. They were the only thing available at the time that looked remotely like you know, a, a bogey tank wagon. It really should be consigned to history, but for six quid and a distinct lack of continental wagons for my representation of the wagons that used to flow from Harwich to the rest of the country via the train ferry. The challenge to myself was to have a little bit of fun, annoy the rivet counters and purists, and try and produce a wagon of that looks quite realistic. Most of this would be achieved by just fixtures and fittings, replacing the handrails and handbrake on the walkway, the handrails underneath the buffers and the securing eyes and hooks on the sole bar with these that I got from 51L Wizard Models. Because I couldn't establish whether this model was based on an actual real wagon, it's going to be what I'm going to call in the style of. And that, and that means there really shouldn't be any right or wrong. It's only looking at reference pictures and working out what looks good. Instead of concentrating on the fixtures and fittings, I really should have dealt with the wheels first. There's a joke in there somewhere about picking up women. To get my new bogies to fit, I had to do quite a lot of surgery underneath, and that meant removing the old bogey pivot point. I then dropped a piece of 80 thou plaster card in as a new base for the replacement bogey. And then to get the right ride height I had to get another piece in that didn't foul the wheel sets. I think it's worth noting that Lima did actually get one thing right with this model. Because it's a continental design and it has a riding platform. The bogey at the non-platform end is closer to the buffers than the bogey at the platform end is. It jumped back a little bit there because I had to refilm that bit for the measuring. The donor wagon also provided its bogey pivot points. To get the correct ride height, I used a few offcuts of plastic card and a balancing trick and everything was glued into place. Because the offset of the bogey pivot point on the platform end was a bit longer, I had to extend the shaft that the NEM pocket sits on to get the correct coupling spacing. With construction or reconstruction completed, it was then time to go off to paint. I'm going to try something a bit new here. I really love my Revel and Humbrol enamel paints, but it's time I dipped my brush into the world of acrylics. MIG by Ammo is what we're using. First of all, the grey base primer, black primer on the bogies and chassis underframe. And to get the stripe on the barrel, it was orange. And once masked off, it was then three coats of light grey. Now I screwed it up here a little bit because I should have attached the barrel to the, the chassis instead of painting it. And it took me ages to well hide the seam line. Before that pain though I did get the satisfaction of removing my masking tape to reveal a lovely straight orange line. Yeah a little bit of detail painting to finish off the decoration before we tackle the transfers. 
decals and numbering, which will allow me to show off some of my high quality graphics and animation. I know you love it. Before that though, we'll just take a quick look back at what Lima put on their number panel. And anybody see what's wrong with it? You were correct if you said it was two numbers short. It had the exchange code, which is the first two numbers. It was wrong because it had 21 instead of 33. Now, if you don't want to learn about international wagon numbering, I'd skip forward a minute or two. So we've got two of our 12 digits, which is the exchange code. Now, and that tells us what type of wagon it is, what standard it is to uh, built to, where it can and can't go. Ours is 33, which is non-common user, bogey, fixed gauge, privately owned to RIV or PPW standard designs. Next is our country code. We're having 80, which is Germany. The next four numbers are the number block or the class of wagon. And this runs into 30 odd pages and it's really complicated. We've got 7894. I'll link the page and the web page in the description. The next three digits are the vehicle identification. So in homage to what it was that Lima ID'd it as, I'm going to keep it as 291. The last digit is the computer check number. How do we get that? Glad you asked. We'll write it out. So we've got our exchange code, our country code, our number block, and our vehicle ID number. So we look at our digits in the odd positions and we times those by two. The numbers in the even positions stay as their face value. And then once we've written all those out, we add them all up, individually, the numbers. And then quick calculation, that should be 57. And then to get our check number, we add on a number that will take us to the next multiple of 10. So we've got 57, we add on 3 to get 60, so 3 is our check number. Not forgetting our anchor, that denotes that we're allowed on the train ferry, for you ultra-modern Modelers, you will need a channel tunnel uh, emblem motif or logo. As for the other digits that you can see on that panel, I don't really understand what they are and I can't explain them. But they have to be there, so they are. Two coats of varnish sealed all the transfers in and then it was time to make it look a bit work-worn. First was a coat of, well, thinned brown and it's really difficult to film. But it is there, as you can see on this ghost patch. Next was a little bit of chipping by the sponge method on the roof bars. If you want to learn more about this method and how it's supposed to be done, I'll try and leave a card in the corner of one of the armour modellers that I watch. If not, I'll leave a link in the description as well to his video. And as you can see, I used dark grey to chip the light grey and light grey to chip the dark grey and then on the bigger chips filled them in with a paintbrush and a rust colour. That was all done with the acrylics. Next was an enamel wash. We let that dry for about five to ten minutes and then we come in with our nice big flat brush that's been dipped in thinners and dried off and then we just blend it all in downwards to create streaking and under my bright table lamp it looks quite well quite a lot but in normal light you can hardly notice it then it was a case of going around the rest of the wagon picking out other details with the same method a little bit of wash wait five minutes then blend it out with our brush dipped in thinners next up was weathering powders and i did half the wagon just so you can see the contrast. So I'm piling it on the top and then with a big flat brush, just brushing it downwards. I'm using just the two colors, which is MIG 3005 medium rust 
and MIG 3008 track rust. I think I've probably put a bit too much on, so it's just a case of blending it and blending it and blending it until I got the, the effect that I was sort of looking for. It was time to take off our ghost patching and then with our big flat brush we just soften the edges. Switching our attention to the bogies and these ones seem to always have slightly rusty red springs. So I tried out a new method which I think is called wet blending where you put a little bit of pigment fixer and mix it with the pigment and then brush it on like a paint and try not to get big blobs of it all over everything else. That was just the medium rust. And then about half an hour after it's dried off properly, it was just blending everything back down again, taking the harshness off with the track rust. Then just for laughs, I thought I'd break out the gloss black and do a bit of heavy oiling on the bearings. And that was with enamel paint. After about half an hour, once it dried out properly, I then hit it with some wet effects, which is MIG 2015. For fear of making it look like a rusting heap of junk that should be in a scrapyard, I decided to call it a day. Prior to final assembly, I misted on some pigment fixer it through the airbrush. Overall, I'm really pleased with the way it's turned out even if the weathering was just a little bit OTT. It took a little bit longer than I expected as well. So onto the layout and into revenue earning service, we see it winding its way out of Tolmy Junction Yard with a raft of other ferry wagons destined for Harwich and the continent. We'll revisit the continental wagon scene in future episodes, and that will probably be in the shape of these Hornby double O tank wagons. In the meantime, thanks for watching. See you next time.